So, uh, so just to give you a brief introduction, so I am, uh, th uh, this is Nitesh Khandelwal. Uh, I am uh, one of the co-founders of Accountants and IRH Group and uh, I have been um, uh, active into the financial markets for almost a decade now. Today, uh, today's webinar's idea is to get, shed some light from our past experience and uh, also of the market for both theoretical as well as from the practical perspective. So, uh, to give you a brief agenda, so the agenda would be the uh, a small brief introduction to momentum trading, what it is, why it works. Then we move on to the popular momentum trading strategies. I would not say strategies, but more of uh, various oscillators and indicators which are there, which are quite popular. Uh, then we will see uh, briefly on uh, momentum trading in HFT, uh, followed by some risks which are uh, specific to momentum trading and uh, some which are also specific to the uh, algorithmic trading uh, using momentum trading strategies. And we'll also uh, try to cover a sample model which uh, we created for this webinar uh, in which we have uh, tried to create a, a, a model in Excel uh, for one of the momentum trading strategies. Uh, I think if we had done it for the HFT, it might have gone out of scope for this webinar. Uh, we do cover that in the uh, course, but um, uh, for this webinar sake, we have gone for optimization where we are we are running it for the one minute candle on Excel rather than uh, on a tick by tick that you would uh, uh, often see in case of uh, HFT or say for um, uh, days long data uh, in case of low frequency. So. Um, so yeah, so the so introduction to momentum trading. So what is momentum trading? Uh, momentum trading. So momentum trading are the strategies. Sorry, uh, just screen. Yeah, momentum trading are the uh, uh, strategies are the ones where your trading decision is done by observing significant movement in a trading in a direction along with relatively higher volume. So the points to note here are that uh, fun is your one is your uh, trading decision is done by the observing significant movements. So when I say significant movements, we are uh, referring to the significant price movements in a uh, and in a particular direction. So if either on the upside or on the downside, but there has to be significant movement in the direction with relatively higher volumes. So by relatively, we say that, okay, uh, because different asset classes or different stocks will have different kind of um, uh, volumes or uh, different kind of volume profile. So we say that, okay, we look at the volume profile by taking say, uh, in, a, in a very base case scenario, it can be simply the average of the past um, uh, past a few candles or past few days, or it can be a more uh, sophisticated where you look at the complete volume profile based on the hour and the uh, day and the seasonality and you uh, account for that and you look, look, look out for that. So the idea is that it should be, it should be coming in with some exceptional, if not exceptional, but uh, superseding volumes as compared to what you will have for um, uh, a regular, uh, in a regular course of time. So in this, in momentum trading strategies, mostly, uh, most of the tra uh, conventional trading strat uh, strategies have been based on the indicators. And um, uh, a lot of the new age uh, momentum trading strategies, they are also based on event triggers. So not to say that event triggers were not popular earlier, but it was more of, um, uh, say corporate action was to be announced or the news uh, for a company had come and the trader will read it and uh, then take uh, action based on that expecting some momentum which will be picked in, uh, in the stock or the asset class and then play on it, right? Uh, but, um, uh, but in case of um, uh, like these days you have machine readable news where you do not really need um, uh, the trader to read that, the machine does it for you, right? So uh, so the decision making is much faster and can be automated and uh, you can scan through thousands of stocks and keep on picking that which one would you like to uh, pick up. So so that's there. Now uh, just to uh, understand briefly on how, where does this momentum thing comes from. So momentum, uh, those of you who are science grads might recollect from your school, uh, school physics book where uh, momentum is uh, your price multiplied by, oh, sorry, not a price, but the, uh, the mass multiplied by the velocity, right? So if, uh, if a body is going with a, if, if you're throwing the ball and um, uh, it is going with a certain velocity, so the, the, the product of the two, the, uh, how heavy it is, the mass of the ball, and how much velocity it is, so it, that will impact that how much powerful it, uh, um, uh, the impact would be when it is going to hit something or the impulse that it would be creating. So, which is again, impulse can again be measured separately, but but yes, yeah, so that's the 
textbook uh, scientific physics definition of momentum which has been adopted into various uh, uh, various uh, uh, ways of life uh, like in even in sports you have uh, those of you who are a cricket fan or a uh, or, a, or a football fan so you would uh, often hear whenever you are hearing the commentary that um, that the momentum is on the side on the winning side so this this side is expected to win because momentum is with them or they have been uh, say if some team is winning consecutively so they have a momentum for winning so it's a basically a continuation of a uh, of a pattern or continuation of uh, an event which is which has been happening for a while and is expected to uh, continue again so so that's how we have also um, also uh, understood momentum in financial markets as the price volume momentum so the how the price and volumes are growing and if uh, the price is going up or the price is going down uh, significant volumes then we expect that it will continue in that uh, in that uh, in that direction because of the momentum that it has gathered All right so uh, so the, uh, the the interesting one question is that um, uh, does it work so in financial markets especially in the trading there are things which work there are things that won't work but the interesting thing is that uh, uh, something which does not which works for somebody uh, might not work for someone else so it depends on so many different things how you test your models or how you uh, about your risk management profile is how you how, how you implement what kind of infrastructure you have for implementation so all those things actually uh, make a um, uh, make a um, uh, 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 impact on uh, how the performance of the of the strategy would be at the end of the day in the real market. So, so it there is no correct answer whether uh, whether it works or not. But if you apply it methodic methodically and uh, in a scientific manner, then you can expect it to work. So uh, the probability of it working would be higher than probability of it not working. So which means that it's not necessary that the uh, it will work. The likelihood is higher to work rather than not to work. So, um, so, so as I said, that uh, like, uh, uh, so there, there are a few things which um, are uh, like physics example which I was giving that momentum and impulse. So, one thing is that uh, how much momentum a, a moving body has, and second thing is if so like impulse, which is nothing but m delta v, so mass and multiplied by change in velocity, right? So, if you're throwing a ball at the uh, at the wall, so the impulse that is being generated on the uh, on the wall would be equal to the mass multiplied by the change in velocity. So in case uh, you're hitting a ball with the with a wall, it would be it would be uh, changing the direction of the velocity too. So the the impulse will be really great. So same happens with the financial markets too. So if the uh, if you are if the price is going uh, with a very high speed, uh, if 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 it is moving up rapidly, then you would expect it to go up till the time there is an impulse which is stopping it. From uh, uh, from uh, from moving uh, moving ahead like that, or alternatively, also to move up like that, it will need an impulse that has to come. So that's why we have these event triggers like momentum trading. We have mostly it's the event triggers which happen. So uh, so there is something some some news or some uh, some event which has happened, uh, which can say there can be macroeconomic events like. Uh, like say some GDP data or inflation uh, data is coming or some rate decisions uh, coming which which impacts a lot of uh, which can impact the different industries altogether or it can be stock specific say uh, some corporate action or some uh, some news about the new invention or innovation done by a company say say technology company like Facebook or Apple when they're launching something new so the stock price is very sensitive to that so that can you can uh, take that as an impulse in these in these scenarios so, so yeah. So uh, next is on the why variation, why variation across asset classes. So um, in this case, what we so I'll do the purple screen again. Yeah. So um, so why? Uh, so another another question is that um, uh, some of the moment of trading strategies they are uh, applicable for. Um, no, for uh, they, they 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 behave uh, quite well for some of the stocks or asset classes, but. For a lot of different uh, uh, different asset classes, they don't really behave that well. So, what can be the reason? So, one of the reason can be that uh, in different asset classes, you have different participants, so who have different behavior, different trading behavior, or different uh, investment behavior, different investment profile. So, say for example, in case of um, uh, in case of um, uh, of uh, FX or um, uh, stocks, you will see that lot. It's mostly a lot of people who are retail 
they contribute to it. But in case of FX, you have uh, on the other side, you also have big institutions who are making the market. So the market makers are normally the liqu big liquidity providers or the uh, big banks, big financial institutions who are um, uh, who are um, uh, providing liquidity to the market. So they have a different uh, behavior, different trading profile as compared to someone who is a retail trader and himself so is trading for his own money uh, and, and as a pastime, not really as a like as a profession, but uh, more as a pastime, then he would have a very different, a different uh, 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 trading profile. So the behavior would be different. So the the way the prices move, the volumes uh, pick up, that would be different for asset, different asset classes. So that is something that uh, we should be uh, very much aware of while uh, deciding on a on a, a strategy. Second thing is also external factors and seasonality. So that is something like um, uh, there are uh, some industries which uh, which have a very different cycle as compared to rest of the market. So uh, so to give you an example, there uh, uh, there was a time like in 2008 2009 when the the oil prices were going up like crazy, right? So when um, when they were up like 100, 120, 130, so crude was crossing every level. So at that point of time, uh, the lot of stocks which were into the oil exploration or oil refinery uh, or oh, sorry, oil exploration or drilling business or the companies which are associated with that. So the market used to go up when the oil prices go down, uh, were, were going down, but the and these but these companies will go down. Or that is underperform the market. But when the market uh, when the crude prices were shooting up, so it was a big worry for everyone that it will impact the growth, it will uh, bring in inflation resulting in higher interest rate and uh, therefore uh, all the, like most of the industries, the stocks from most of the industries will fall. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the stocks for these companies which were into oil exploration or drilling, uh, so they used to go up at that time. So, so there is a seasonality uh, which can come in the form of say um, a quarter, uh, so the, based on actual weather seasons or also based on um, what the flavor of the market is at that time. Because right now it, it doesn't happen that if the, uh, if the crude prices are going up, uh, then the all stock prices for all these go, uh, companies go up and uh, uh, for the rest of the market it goes down. So that's not the case currently because um, uh, it's also what we call is the flavor of the market. So what is the uh, thing that the market is focusing at at that point of time? So that uh, for a, for a day trader or for um, uh, someone who is trading for a very small duration, um, uh, so these things matter a lot. Next is on um, uh, the technical and quantitative analysis. So so the uh, momentum has been one of the key aspects of technical analysis. So where um, a lot of indicators are uh, have been created based on price. So technicals normally do not have that much uh, inclination towards stats. So that is one one way. So technicals is like we all, uh, like we say is more of an art rather than a science. But on the other hand, quantitative analysis in which you look at the statistical behavior and um, uh, use the statistical models to come up with uh, uh, different strategies. Uh, which include including uh, the, those on momentum. So that is also where you can you can come up with some statistical backing that okay uh, this is the data I have run these statistical tests. This is uh, how the statistical properties of this um, uh, of this um, uh, stock or asset class looks like, and this is the expected behavior which I have uh, um, which I have de deduced by running all these uh, different statistical tests. Right, so so that gives more backing to your model that okay, this is something which is based on data analysis and uh, it is expected to work as an you're just improving the likelihood of the model at the end of the day, right? So this is how you can actually try to uh, improve the likelihood of success in your um, in your trading strategies, especially on the momentum side, and yeah, so and these are also the things that you need to take care of. Now next is on the popular momentum trading strategies. So uh, this one is uh, something the conventional ones. So which we have, um, which we have um, like momentum and oscillator. So momentum in itself is also an oscillator, which is nothing but the uh, uh, difference of prices over a period of time, as uh, Mr. John Murphy uh, describes in his technical analysis, like which is considered as one of the bibles of technical analysis, I guess, in the modern times. So uh, so so it's nothing but the difference of the prices at uh, 
uh, over a period of time. So say if I'm looking at the end day momentum, so it would be today's price minus the price which was there end days back, right? So what does it tell me? It tells me the the notional amount by which the the price has moved, right? So it, if you drag it down and uh, move it to um, uh, across the data series, then you will see that okay, it is changing and it is just giving me what is the difference in prices over this period of time. But the same thing, uh, but it does not tell you how much. Like if you are trading into different stocks and uh, one stock is at uh, trading at say ten dollars and another stock is trading at five hundred dollars. So, um, so a momentum, say twelve day momentum for a uh, ten dollar stock is say for example uh, fifty cents. And um, for the five hundred dollars is um, uh, say uh, one dollar. So even though the momentum is twice uh, in case of a uh, five hundred dollar stock, it does not tell me that uh, actually the the stock which is of ten, the ten dollar stock has much higher volatility and also uh, it has much higher uh, momentum as compared to the uh, five hundred dollar stocks because uh, stock because it has a we are uh, we are saying it in the, in terms of um, um, in terms of your uh, prices and notional prices rather than the percentage or log terms. So if we do that in the log, uh, percentage log terms, then we will see that uh, yes, uh, that will give us a better idea in terms of if we are if we are trading hundred tr stocks together or say thousand stocks together. So that would be something you, which you can use to uniform uniformize it. Then second is your uh, ROC, which is also the rate of change. Which is nothing but the again the the difference between the prices over a period of time, but you divide it by the uh, end days uh, like price which was there end days back or end candles back. So so that multiplied by hundred, so that gives you the um, that that gives you the ROC or uh, rate of change. So that is more uh, you can say normalized because you are essentially what you're doing is that you are calculating the percentage return over a period of end end duration. Then uh, RSI is another one where you have which is relative strength index, so uh, which is primarily based on relative strength. So relative strength is nothing but the average of um, uh, so like if, I, if I'm calculating 14-day RSI, 14-day relative strength index, so I will be looking at 14-day relative strength. So which is nothing but uh, it will be the average of the up uh, average of the returns or the upside. So when uh, when the stock is going up and uh, on the days or on the duration that the stock has gone up divided by the uh, average of the uh, stock prices when it was going uh, or the returns when it was going down and that so 1 by 1 plus rs uh, into 100 that 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 gives you the rsi so that's a um, uh, that's an indicator of um, what is the uh, uh, what is the RSI? How much overbought or oversold it is? So if it is say in the terms of like uh, less than 30, so you will you, so you will say that uh, it is uh, quite oversold. The market is quite oversold, and uh, you can expect a reversal. When it is uh, above, like in the range of 70 to 80, you will say that market is quite overbought, and uh, you might expect a reversal. Now, when we say overbought, bought and oversold, um, the the different people use them from different perspective. Those who uh, believe that some people believe that okay, this is a reversal time, but some on the contrary can also believe that there are too much strength in the market. So if you're and mostly if you're a momentum trader, then you are more likely to uh, adopt to that that okay, if there's too much strength in the market, then I'll go ahead and rather buy that stock when it is overbought rather than uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, selling it at that point of time. So that is open to interpretation. That depends on what stock you're trading, what what kind of uh, uh, backtesting results you have. What so ultimately you need to find a logic uh, of of what you're doing. So, uh, but these are good indicators, which does give you a brief idea. But now, uh, how much you want to, uh, in which direction you want to use it, that is totally up to you and your analysis. Then another is stochastic oscillator. So just a word of caution for those who are from the statistical background, this has got nothing to do with the stochastic as such, but uh, more of its name, or, uh, name, which is stochastic oscillator, which is nothing but um, uh, the price, uh, uh, the difference between the current price and the 
uh, low price of previous X days and divide by the high price minus low price of the previous X days. So that gives me the uh, a stochastic and uh, stochastic oscillator and I take the three day average, moving average or exponential moving average of that depending on how you want it. So uh, so that gives you percent K and uh, then you take the three day, uh, three candle average, moving average of that, that gives you the percent D and then you make that as oscillator then whenever percent k is crossing from pers uh, or percent d from below then you are buying uh, whenever it is going uh, uh, crossing the percent d from above to low then you are selling so so interpretations i'm uh, just verbally saying it out because uh, i don't want to put it out there because uh, we over the period of time that i have seen um, it's not uh, the interpretation is never uh, universal so they are more of um, um, uh, it's based on a lot of lot of things actually, so so that's why we do not keep it. Um, uh, uh, the interpretations we uh, we say that it is personal interpretation or the model modelistic in interpretation than anything else. Uh, so these four uh, that we discussed just now, so these four of uh, the uh, oscillators or um, the indicators, these are uh, considered as the leading indicators because uh, there is not. Too much of uh, you're not averaging out or you're not um, smoothing out things. So, uh, so it, it the theoretically uh, in technical analysis, it would say that uh, these indicators would lead the market, as and um, they would tell you that this is what is expected to happen now without consuming too much of historical information. But the MA cross, moving average crossovers, and moving average convergence divergence MA series. So these are the considered as the lagging. Um, uh, lagging uh, indicators. So, so because they use the different, uh, the, the lot of information from the past, so like uh, moving average would be where you're taking the average of the past X number of days, uh, 10 days, 20 days, 5 days, 8 days, or those who are fans of Fibonacci might take like uh, uh, 2 days, 3 days, 5 days, 8 days, 13 days, 21 days, right? So, so you would see um, uh, uh, those numbers a lot uh, in different models. So, uh, so whenever the, so you have two different moving averages. So one is small moving average, another one is large moving average. And whenever the small is crossing the uh, low, uh, uh, the large moving average from below to upwards, so that means that the small small time uh, time uh, time period uh, small time frame uh, trend is moving up and is expected to gather some steam. So, which is a buy indicator. And whenever it is um, uh, crossing from above. To below the moving average, uh, the small moving average is crossing the lower uh, large moving average from above to below. In that case, we see that okay, so the trend seems to be reversing in the short term, and if it continues, then uh, even the long term uh, moving average will also be coming down. So, which is a, uh, essentially a sell signal. So, uh, so that's uh, about moving average crossover, and then the MSCD is um, uh, nothing but uh, we take the moving averages, we take the difference, and um, we create an um, a, a, a exponential moving average uh, based on uh, uh, for that for that moving average differences. So, small moving average minus large moving average. So, we take that difference, plot that, and then we take the nine-day exponential moving average for that. That gives me the signal line. So, so the same treatment what we were doing for moving averages we do for the MSCD and the signal line, which gives me the um, the trading signals that whether it is buy or sell. So, whenever it is crossing from above to below, that's a uh, to the signal line, it's a sell. Whenever it's crossing from below to above, it's a buy. So. So let's move on to the moment of trading strategies and um, how we uh, how we uh, uh, how, uh, how we can actually implement these strategies in the um, uh, in the HFT space. So, uh, so almost everything that you can do in low frequency, you can do in high frequency, but not everything that you can do in high frequency, you can do in low frequency. The key reasons are the amount of complexity complexity in terms of the data that you will be using and the data answers that you do. So that varies a lot. So that is uh, that is very much um, uh, so. So HFT is quite uh, resource hungry and uh, data intensive as compared to uh, as compared to uh, say a uh, uh, low frequency strategy. Primarily because of the amount of data that is involved. That's the first reason. So so the amount of data that you deal with in HFT is mostly uh, tick by tick data. So just just to give you. A, Example: Say if I am doing a low-frequency trading strategy, which is say um, 
one day uh, one day data for a particular stock or say even for say thousand stocks so a uh, daily data for even for 10 years that would be in like uh, the size would be in few mbs or maybe few 10 mbs or few maybe it uh, if it is like very intense uh, data for thousand stocks it might touch I don't know. Not no, no. It will not touch 100 MB still. In even in that case, it will still be probably in 10 MB or so. But in case if you are doing it for HFT and uh, you are uh, running that strategy, that that data, tick by tick data for uh, not 10 years, not one year, but say even for um, uh, one day. So even for one day, the data will be running for say thousand stocks. Uh, tick by tick data would be running in GBs, right? So just for a single day. So just to give you an idea, in India, if you are um, uh, just the derivative segment, say fusion option segment, if you record the data, take by take, so a file can easily go up to like 25, 30 GB or more um, for one single day of data. So to analyze that data, you have to use specific tools. So R, MATLAB, or there are other tools also available, which you will have to use um, uh, to make sense, some sense out of it. You cannot do that on Excel or uh, say a simple, uh, programming tool. So that's that's where uh, one of the key uh, different area comes in and then obviously in the implementation it is very different. So in case of HFT uh, the implementation is almost uh, everything is automated and uh, you send a lot of orders uh, and like most of the HFT firms they send thousands of orders every second on, on a single exchange itself right. So that is uh, that is something which is uh, very very um, uh, again, um, a technology intensive and infrastructure intensive. So, if you're if you're doing it from that pers uh, from that sense, but the interesting part is so so far what I've been saying is that HFT is uh, resource hungry and uh, intensive and data intensive, all those things and technology uh, intensive. But the good part is that um, since you are looking at take say if you're looking at tick by tick data, so you have all the information available to you to make the decision. So if you are using a daily data, you just know, say, even if it is a candle data for one day, so you just know that this is where the market opened today. This is where um, the uh, the price at which it um, uh, uh, went up till the high, uh, the high price. This is where it uh, went low, as in at, till this price it uh, it went uh, on the lower side, and this is where it closed. So only four data points. You'd know nothing else, right? And maybe volumes, open interest, whatever that uh, at that um, 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 for that particular day. But when you are looking at the tick by tick data, now you have everything. You have every whenever someone is changing anything across all through the order book. It's not like um, you are just um, uh, seeing the best bid and best ask. You can see deep down, not just to top five levels or top ten levels, but to say hundredth or two hundredth level. Um, in the order book, that what is the what are, what are the orders which are which are there, right? What is the size of those orders? What is the uh, fragment? Uh, how fragmented the order book is? Um, say below the top five, so which uh, everyone will see on the snapshot data. But in tick by tick data, you get to get the access to that complete information. And when you run the analysis on that information, and uh, your model uh, model makes some prediction. Then the the probability again the likelihood of uh, uh, success for those trades increases dramatically because more information means more um, understanding uh, the better the better predictability as compared to say if you are just looking at the closing price and uh, deciding on it so that's one so so uh, most of the momentum uh, trading strategies which you do in um, uh, in case of um, uh, HFT what you do is that um, uh, you look at the order book. You look at the order book trends. So, like, um, uh, how much? Say, for a very basic example, would be how, uh, what is the uh, total buy quantity and the total sell quantity, which is available. And you can say that okay, I would. Uh, there might be people who might be trying to game me by putting uh, uh, very big orders deep down the order book. So I can say that okay, I'll just check the top seven uh, order books or uh, the order books within the 0.1% uh, of the uh, best order price. So like best bid and best ask. So what is the uh, what is the uh, intensity there? What is the um, um, uh, depth there in terms of how many how many shares are there? What is the buying pressure? And then I calculate the buying pressure and selling pressure based on that. So that's a very basic example, but uh, that you can use that to predict that what the momentum seems like. So that's one. Then second can be we can look at tick by tick movement. That okay in the past 
10 ticks in the say past uh, 100 microseconds or uh, 500 microseconds or say 1 millisecond in the past 10 or 100 ticks this is what has this is what has happened so if it is happening so uh, whenever someone is sending an order uh, a lot of people would be reacting to the similar news right someone will be reacting faster someone will be reacting slower so in case if there is an event which is triggered so you would be able to see the trend much before it reflects in the like uh, in a candle say in a one minute candle if someone is looking at that or say 15 minute candle so you would be able to grasp that information much before that and you can you can play on that so that's uh, that's that these are the uh, like uh, tick based uh, analysis that you can do on the order book and then you can also do on the order base so there uh, you are seeing some big orders which are coming in at very attractive prices um, but single orders and uh, you can see that okay someone is um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, someone is trying to whenever it's, uh, it's getting executed he's replacing it with another one say similar quantity or different quantity but uh, say big big order so you know that there is a consistent buying pressure someone is trying to um, uh, get a big position in that in that um, in that stock right so you can you can feel that if someone is trying to create a big position then you can expect some momentum in that so you can expect that a continuation of uh, buying uh, pressure would be would be uh, would be seen in that and you can based on that you can uh, plan your strategy so that's on the ticket level analysis now the second thing is that um, uh, transaction cost so what we mean here is by transaction cost is uh, so when you're playing at the tick data uh, you are talking about very small um, uh, time periods, very small time periods, like in microseconds and milliseconds, right? So within that time, you would not expect the prices to move dramatically. So it will be like one tick movement, five tick movement, maybe ten ticks movement at times of high volatility, but not beyond that. Between in, uh, in between ticks, so it, you would not expect that at least. And um, um, so so the so what it means is that. Uh, even if you're predicting it rightly, if you even if you're predicting the uh, the direction correctly, you would need to make sure that uh, your transaction costs are in sync with your profit targets. So there is no point of having a model which is uh, which has a 90% hit ratio uh, only to be seen as 0% hit ratio when the transaction costs are incorporated in that. So in HFT, transaction costs are sacrosanct. You cannot have like you would like to have zero, obviously. So, but uh, in most of the cases, it is not possible unless there are some exchange incentives. So, uh, so if it is not zero, then uh, you have to make sure that you have one of the lowest transaction costs in the market. So, like uh, you, so you obviously uh, there would not be a high differential, high differential in the transition transition cost as such. But uh, what you can do is that, say, if you are HFT firm, you would prefer to have a direct connection with the exchange. You prefer to have a say your own membership with the exchange rather than going through um, going through a broker and paying a brokerage out there. Yeah, so all those things matters a lot <clears throat> because in most of the cases you will uh, say say in case of uh, a say market making strategy for example in HFT, uh, your uh, your target profits are uh, very much and most of the times are like bid ask spread right. Or uh, uh, and bid ask spread is uh, uh, very much a function of how much the transaction cost is. So, uh, so if you're just making bid ask spread, uh, then you might expect just to recover transaction cost. That too, when you are correct almost all the time. In most of the cases, not all the cases, but in most of the cases. So, uh, so that's that's why it's very important to uh, look at the when you're deciding on what stock you want to trade. Uh, you should look at uh, what would be the transition cost for that. What is the how many ticks is that? Is that less than one tick, more than one tick? If it's less than one tick, then you're good. Then you can uh, go ahead and do whatever. But uh, if it is more than one tick, then you have to see that what how much would be the bid ask spread that you'll be paying when you're taking a position, and uh, what is the potential profit target that you have for your moment, uh, even if when you're uh, predicting the correct momentum. So those things have to be worked on. Next is on defining exits. So exits, um, uh, when you are on the HFT side, so in, in, in a low frequency side, you can very much do, what you can do is um, uh, you can define exits at, uh, say, whenever the moving average is crossing down, or you can, you can basically make use of the lagging indicators too. But in case of uh, HFT, you cannot go for lagging indicators because uh, you are playing on a very short term and uh, you have to 
either lead the market if not lead the market then you have to act as and when something is happening right so so what you typically do is that your uh, if your entry is based on few ticks of uh, data analysis then you will be defining your exit also based on the few ticks of data analysis so like whenever you see a even a small uh, change in direction uh, from your trade you would most likely would like to uh, uh, change it so most likely you would like to square it off the that's that trading uh, position of yours so uh, but uh, uh, traditionally what happens is that you either exit when the momentum is waning so you use some indicators or use the combination of indicator to decide that okay this uh, is suggesting that the momentum in our strategy uh, in, uh, in the in the stock is uh, waning is going down so that using that combination you said okay I will exit at this price um, whether it's stop loss or take profit that is totally up to us you can also define um, your own uh, standard uh, uh, stop loss and take profit levels can be in percentage terms or which can be in ball points term volatility points term so all these things can be done but uh, if you're doing in at the HFT then you would like to uh, Either you go for the fixed uh, uh, stop loss take profits, or you the criteria for deciding the stop loss take profit has to be uh, should not del uh, should not lag a lot. And second is also exit sets high momentum. So this is what a lot of contrarian traders do. So what they uh, say is because if the momentum is increasing, a momentum trader would say that okay, momentum is increasing, I'll rather increase my position because it is expected to continue that pattern. But if I'm a contrarian tra uh, trader, uh, like uh, at least from the momentum perspective, then I would say that okay, too high momentum, the price is uh, going up too uh, too rapidly, then I would guess that this will wane off now. So uh, so I would uh, uh, I would preempt it and exit the exit the position. So the analogy for that would be like someone is running uh, running is he's jogging in a marathon. So that's good. So he will. Uh, you would expect that um, uh, that person will complete that 21 kilometer, 42 kilometers marathon in good time, you know, in his own sweet time. But he'll complete it. But uh, if you someone starts with like, okay, I'll run. Start uh, start running. Uh, starts running slowly, but uh, then picks up and like starts running with, uh, like crazy uh, like at his uh, highest acceleration and momentum and velocity possible. Then uh, uh, then you would expect him to um, to tire off. Very soon and uh, not reach the target, right? So, so that's that's the that's the philosophy of um, of these traders who uh, who prefer to exit at the when the momentum is uh, reaching too high or the change in momentum is getting too high. Then, um, uh, then another is quoting versus hitting. So, in uh, almost almost all the HFT strategies, you never hit the market. You always um, you always quote. So you have because as I said, that transition cost is a key component. And bid ask, and since your profit targets are really small, so you do not want to pay uh, the bid ask spread because your uh, your your profit target might be like two times or three times the transition cost or the bid ask spread. So uh, you if you're hitting, then you're paying like almost uh, one part of it right away in the beginning. So in almost all cases, almost all cases, you would you will see that you're always quoting rather than hitting in the market. Now, uh, just to go through the quickly uh, the risks in momentum trading strategies. So, um, the risks in momentum tra trading strategies. Are one is obviously there is a lot of price risk because it's a purely directional bet, right? So, uh, in case of uh, low frequency, the risk, the directional risk is slightly higher because your position is open for a longer time, and uh, uh, most of the time you will be taking uh, bigger positions as compared to in case of HFT, you focus more on the churning. So you will be buying, selling, buy, selling, buy, selling with a very small price movement. So your uh, uh, your your profits would not be huge, your losses would not be huge. But what that helps you in doing is that um, you it's easier to maintain uh, the loss loss scenarios and the profit scenarios. Right. So how much loss you would like to stop at? So the uh, the granularity of uh, uh, the changes in uh, take profit, stop loss, uh, uh, of profit and loss is much lower. Or rather, gravity is smaller. Then, second is entry and exit timing. So this is uh, this is quite uh, interesting. So um, so as we as we saw that some people take up more position when uh, the markets are going the, when the momentum is gathering more steam, and some people prefer to exit at that time. So this is like within your model uh, from the from the purely from the momentum trading perspective, it can be 
a very good amount of risk because it you have to optimize on when you would be entering. So you would be if you're entering too late, that's probably the time then when a lot of guys might be exiting the trade. If you are entering too early but exiting too early, then you would not be able to ride the momentum wave, right? So your uh, if your hit ratio, unless your hit ratio is too awesome, you would uh, you would be facing facing uh, issues there. Then uh, something specific to HFT or machine readable uh, like automated trading would be the false alarm. So so which is an interesting case. So what happens is that in case if you're uh, you're trading, if you're selecting picking stocks based on say machine readable news, so you uh, there is some news in the market for um, uh, for some stock, your machine reads it instantly. It um, uh, it reacts to that. Okay. Now the problem is that uh, in the machine reading read, readable news, uh, it's a um, uh, it's it's basically NLP problem like a uh, natural language processing which it uses to parse the meaning of the of the statements, right? So in an article you will have say ten paragraphs or five paragraphs, and it is looking for select things. Now now the issue is that languages can be funny at times. So say in English, uh, the awful the word awful can be used to describe like uh, something really off awfully good has happened or something awfully bad has happened, right? So if you're just looking at the word awful, then uh, you might end up in uh, in the incorrect decoding of the of the news. So so that's one. And second is also there are false uh, false news which can come uh, because of some system issues, and it's not rare, unfortunately. Like as in rare, uh, if you look at from the how many news articles comes every day and how many are uh, false. So from that perspective, it would be very rare. But uh, from the instances, like number of instances in a year, is not rare. There are a good number of instances which happen every year, where you have uh, uh, where you have triggers which are based on uh, like incorrect news is fed. Like um, uh, even uh, at times the sites are hacked, right? The news portals are hacked. That happened to one of the leading uh, uh, news portals um, uh, very recently, and uh, uh, they can they can publish whatever news. Right, so uh, so that's one, and also there are uh, some events in which what happens is uh, your systems, your uh, strategy would be looking for like like something something funny happened when the Osama bin Laden was um, uh, was killed uh, by U.S. U.S. Navy uh, Navy SEALs. That um, uh, everywhere you would see Osama 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 Al Qaeda Al Qaeda, right? In uh, in every news section, everywhere it was flooded. All the news uh, news articles were flooded with those names, and a lot of algos were um, uh, were programmed that okay, if there's too much news about it, there's only one thing which can happen, and that is there is some attack, some massive attack that has happened. So which is expect normally expected to be bad for the market. So a lot of bots and a lot of algos actually sold uh, sold a lot of stock at that time, uh, which was obviously not correct, and um, uh, the markets eventually rather went up than going down. So they must have lost a good amount of money. But uh, but these are the small nuances which uh, you have to take care when you are automating things because machines do not have common sense. That they do have that much common sense that you that you put uh, into them. Then uh, another is that uh, false like uh, there are a lot of uh, systems which also use uh, social media feeds. So like uh, they would be following. Uh, uh, the uh, the social media analytics. So uh, what is trending? Say on Twitter, something is trending. So there is always some spoofs which might come up, and uh, uh, at times hacks which happen. So I think there was uh, once there was a news which uh, came in that White White House bombed. So it came from very reputed uh, news handle, very reputed news handle, one of the global global leaders, and. Uh, and uh, it, it's a lot of lot of people pick that pick that up uh, instantly. So those who are on the, who are reacting manually, they have that luxury to check on other things or to see okay this is happening, but this does not seem right or something something does not seem right. So you might have the option to check, but a machine is programmed most of the times it's programmed to react immediately rather than uh, waiting for it. So those uh, that, that 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 kind of things we have to. Uh, we have to uh, always main, manage that how how you are going to uh, react to that. So if your momentum, if this is what uh, uh, is feeding your momentum training strategies, then you have to put in a good number of safeguards to make sure that uh, you do not get into a trap or get, do not get stuck. So now let's. So uh, uh, I think it's already 
about five minutes, right? So, so let's move to the model now. And um, um, this is a very simple model. The uh, what we have tried to do is we have taken one minute data. Uh, so I understand we have a number of uh, uh, global participants. So I I try to pick uh, some something interesting which is uh, which is uh, appreciated across the globe. So first option was Apple. Second was uh, Netflix. So I I preferred Netflix for that. So, so I pick the Netflix stock and um, uh, I take the price and volume filter. So what we have defined the entry for the um, uh, entry signal would be based on the price and volume filters that we have created. I'll explain them to you when we move to the model. And uh, the consecutive higher and or lower prices. So, so whenever we are seeing that uh, the closing price for the current candle is um, uh, higher than the previous one and even the previous candle we saw the same thing that um, it was higher than the previous candle to that then we are saying that it's a buy and if it is lower and again lower then it is a sell and the exits we are taking you making use of the acceleration or impulse so basically different people use uh, different names some people call it acceleration some people call it impulse uh, effectively it's nothing but uh, just a, a rate of change of the rate of change right so, um, so that's that's our exit that we are creating. Let's see. Um, just open that. So yeah. So this this is what we have here. Um, sorry, um, I think I need to. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so this is what we have here. So we have defined some input parameters here. So one is small moving average for the prices, large moving average for the prices, volume average small, volume average large, and exit ROC. So what each of these matters uh, means, I will explain that in, uh, over here. So this is nothing but the data. So I have taken one minute candles, so not candle, but the closing prices for one minute for Netflix. Uh, and this is the volume. So, so volume for every um, minute, in that minute how many shares have been traded on that, right? Uh, this is the small volume, so what it is doing is it is just taking the average of the previous three. So volume every small as fixed as three, so it is taking the average of previous three volumes. So you can see that here, um, 9408, um, the volumes over here are, Oh, okay. This one is not the one. These are the ones. Yeah. So, so that we are taking here, um, and uh, over here, what we are doing is that uh, uh, the large volume we are uh, taking the uh, the average of the previous eight rows here. Okay. So, so and the filter that we have here is that uh, if the small wall is greater than the large wall filter, uh, then we are saying that it's a go. That we are, uh, we are, as we as we saw that uh, we were looking at um, how we can um, uh, define the relatively higher volume. So we have defined it in this manner that uh, if the uh, if the 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 uh, volume in this the volume small move, uh, volume average, so like a small moving average for the volume is uh, greater than the large uh, moving average of the volume, then we are saying that it's, um, uh, it seems to be a good point to enter from the volume perspective. The same thing we have done for the prices. So in prices, what we have done is that um, uh, we've taken again three and eight. So I'm also one of the Fibonacci pain fans. So, so I've taken those numbers, so three and eight. Uh, so in um, uh, small moving average for prices, uh, this is a three day average and um, uh, three candle average, sorry, three uh, duration average, three minutes average, and this one is the eight duration average. So again, the same filter. The filter is that if um, the small uh, PX average is greater than the uh, large moving average for the PX, PX is price here. So then we are saying that okay, it's also good to go ahead with. And based on that, so if uh, we are checking if both the signals, as in both the filters, are yes. So that is how we are defining it here. And then we are checking if this price, the price right now is greater than the previous price and the previous price is greater than the previous price to that. Then we are saying that, okay, it can be a buy. So that's how it is. So if you look at uh, look at here, so 108.59 is greater than 108.75, 107.875, and 107.875 is greater than 107.35. So which means, and both these are yes. So that gives me a signal of buy.
and uh, the price at which I'm entering is the immediate price, the entry price at which the uh, the, the same same candle closing price we are taking that. And similarly, then uh, so this is this is the entry signal that we created, and then exit criteria. How we have what we have done here is uh, I have instead of taking the um, uh, log prices like uh, I have taken the log prices instead of a simple moving average because I prefer that. So um, but as in normally in many statistical analysis you go for log prices because of the continuous compounding thing and also because they are additive. So uh, so so we have preferred that here also. I change the formula slightly for my own uh, understanding uh, for my own usage uh, so so here this is nothing but cosmetic change and here it's a uh, ln of uh, the the current for uh, the uh, the current price divided by the price which is eight candles back or five candles back so that's a exit roc that we have given number here five so that's what we are using here so this is giving me um, So this one, uh, so this is giving me the, um, uh, uh, what is the rate of change? So it's nothing but uh, the percentage return or the return over the past five days. So over here, if I look at over here, so 107.545 and then divided by 107.63. So that's what it is giving me here in this case. And then I'm taking the, uh, 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 the difference of uh, uh, simple difference between the current price, the current ROC, and the previous ROC, and dividing it by previous ROC. So that's giving me again the another accelerated ROC or uh, the change, the impulse that we are getting here. And based on that, the criteria is that if let me just freeze these panes. Uh, yeah. So the uh, the idea is that we will exit whenever the if the current uh, if the uh, if the ROC uh, accelerated ROC is if I am bought, if it is going down and again down, so consecutively it is going down, then I would think that uh, a, there seems to be a uh, warning for trend reversal. So I would I would exit my momentum, <coughs> my trading strategy which I have based on momentum, so which has assumed that it will continue. And similarly, in that case, I have what I am doing is that I am looking at the um, Say over here. So in that, in this case, what I'm doing is that I'm looking uh, when the 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 uh, ROC accelerated ROC is increasing consecutively. So that's when we exit. So like over here, you will see that minus 2.41, then it increased to minus 0.89, then increased to 9.79. So I say that okay, uh, it should be exit at this time. All right, and uh, transition. This is just the transition price, as in the price at which we have entered the trade. So one hundred seven point four nine eight. So which is where we entered, and then we. This is the PL that we have for that particular trade. So, so this is how you can uh, you can create a simple uh, momentum trading based uh, trading strategy. So this we have done on the minute data. Uh, if you want to do it on the tick by tick data, unfortunately you cannot do that in Excel. So you would probably use R or some other uh, programming tool which you can use for um, for analyzing that. Uh, for uh, the low frequency or medium frequency side, you can certainly use uh, Excel to uh, do that. There are certain limitations which are there, but you can do still do a reasonable job with that. So. So yeah, so uh, so that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's all for the webinar from my side. So